Okay, so quick review um, of, the of the types of light spectra that we observe, which again is how we understand how matter works at a fundamental level. Um, we have reflection spectra, which is just simply objects that aren't producing their own light. They're just reflecting whatever is incident on them, except for maybe certain wavelengths they might absorb. Um, the instant case is when you have an object that's emitting thermal radiation. Specifically, that's they, they're giving off light only with the, with, with the only variable, essentially, as their temperature. Their temperature entirely determines what that spectrum of light or what the output of light looks like based on, you know, if you have an a, a observer nearby, you can tell entirely what temperature of object you're looking at just by analyzing the spectrum of light they're giving off. Uh, and that's ex exactly how um, night, night vision or infrared goggles work. Uh, you can view the thermal radiation, the mid-infrared radiation that human bodies or, or you know, generally um, exothermic animals uh, are emitting. Uh, and that's a fun calculation to do. If you convert your body temperature from uh, uh, Fahrenheit or Celsius, whatever you're used to, into Kelvin, and then you apply Wien's Law, you can actually calculate exactly what peak temperature your body emits at. Uh, and you can find what range, you know, whether it's in the, the um, hopefully you don't find that it's in the visible range. Uh, you should find that it's, well, you can do the math. Um, so that's thermal radiation where we can tell the, the temperature of an object. And that's how we can measure, that's, that's the, what I said, the universal thermometer of the universe. Instead of sticking a thermometer in some star's butt or whatever, you can just analyze the light to figure out how hot that cloud of gas is. So, again, this looks something like this. Again, wavelength versus intensity of light here. And you have some continuous graph. It can shift left and right due to Wien's law. Further left it goes, the hotter it is. Talking like blue versus red wavelengths. Further right, the cooler it is. Stefan's law tells us also as an object, the same object heats up, it gets higher on the graph if no other variables have changed. Um, okay, so the third one that we want to go through here is, and, and I'm going to talk about this simply just from an observational point of view, without any kind of um, uh, reference to why it's happening. Because, I mean, this is, historically speaking, how you have to learn. You're not given the answer and then checked by a grader when you figure it out, you know. Um, so this is what we call absorption spectrum. And um, the... The person who I think is just uh, incredibly fascinating to look up on the topic of this is, and I, uh, I'm probably going to spell it wrong, but um, Cecilia C -C, Payne Gaposhkin. Actually, I think that's right. I think it's spelled right. Uh, so she was um, one of the, the female um, astrophysicists working at the Harvard Center for Astrophysics back at the turn of the 1900s uh, when, they, when they actually employed a number of just incredibly, you know, remarkable women at, at the Center for Astrophysics, which I eventually did some research at in grad school. Um, but so she is one of the ones who, who solved this incredibly comp complex puzzle of looking at absorption, uh, looking at absorption spectra from literally hundreds of thousands of stars and piecing this whole puzzle together to figure out what it meant. How to figure out what's inside stars is based on the absorption spectra that we observe from them. So I'll at least talk about the observational point of view before kind of she made her remarkable discovery. Um, and I'll give a separate lab kind of analysis, how, how we understand how it works here in lab today. Um, because we can absolutely view this in lab environments. And then the third thing we'll go into is, let's see, um, emission spectra. And in this case here, there's really only, the, the, only, the only reasonable way to discuss this is to give the Bohr model interpretation of it. Um, and so we're going to kind of, you know, get to the punchline before we get to the punchline for him. But the only way to reasonably view it is as electrons jumping ship, basically. So, uh, let's go into some examples of absorption spectra. And just generally speaking, I'll, I'll describe what we're more or less seeing here. And I'll, I'll um, I don't have them pulled up here right now, but I, I will show in the video um, the actual, like, data tables, tables where you can see uh, the absorption spectra for, for example, of our sun. And specifically, the spectra of our sun as viewed from outer space. 
not inhibited by our atmosphere. And what you'll see when you when you view it not necessarily just as a you know row of you know light light dark light dark bands but instead if you view it as kind of the typical way that I've been presenting spectra where we where we graph the wavelength of light so we have a, a spectrometer I mean that's they call that for a reason and you can sample different wavelengths and plot their intensities so that's what these spectrographs always look like here now there's three different kind of main ways of representing a spectra this is the easiest for me in a blackboard, but I'll also try to display them on screen when I reprocess this thing. So in this case here, what we typically see for an absorptive spectra looks like this. It looks almost identical to, and in the case of our sun, it looks almost identical to a black body or a thermally radiating object peaked at lambda max equal to about 5,800, uh, well, not 5,800 Kelvin. Um, it peaks at about, what was it? 580, I think, nanometers or so. Um, and offhand, I think that might be off a few, but whatever. Um, so anyway, though, nope, it's 504, I think. Anyway, um, so there's a certain peak wavelength, except when you sample very precise individual wavelengths, there's a, there's a noticeable absence. So for example, at something like 478 nanometers you might see a very significant drop of light at that exact wavelength. Then it's not just because your detector failed. It's because there's physically less light coming to us at that wavelength than others. You might see another one at 498 nanometers. Now I'm somewhat making up these numbers and I'm also trying to somewhat remember what the, the major emission lines are uh, as well. So uh, I'll get back to why I just used that term like I did. So there might be something at 497 nanometers where there's a noticeable absence. Now maybe in this case, it's just a little bit less than you might expect. So not as pronounced. Now you go all the way up here, uh, you might have a major gap, almost down to zero, at uh, uh, 656 nanometers. And then you might have a little gap over here at 687 or something like that, which will fall close to the infrared now, and so on. So, so you have these little gaps or little smudges where at that exact wavelength, you're not seeing any light. Now, if you've ever, you know, seen, you know, before the, the like this, a big blow up poster of the sun spectra where they, um, you know, divide in like 15 rows, each spanning like a range of 50 nanometers, something like that. And you can, what, what they show there is the second way of visualizing this, where they, they show a brightness versus a color. And so in that case, you see there, most of the, most of the range of the spectrum is very bright, except for a couple of dark bands corresponding to these wavelengths where we're seeing fewer photons. So the point is though, it is lacking certain specific wavelengths, but otherwise it looks more or less like at, at, at minimum a continuous spectrum, if not better yet, a thermal spectrum. And I, I hope the difference there is, is, is clear. A thermal spectrum obeys specifically the Planck radiation or the, the Planck curve here. Um, a continuous one is just, there's, it doesn't drop to zero anywhere. So this is very clearly not a continuous spectrum. Um, okay, so that's what a absorption spectra looks like, our sun. You might see others that are simply just, and so this is a really, you know, a really basic one. The actual, you know, image of it for our sun might, is, is going to look something like this one graph. There's just all sorts of little dots. There's literally hundreds of them that you can identify. Uh, and that starts to look now kind of like a little monster or something like that. Um, but even something as simple as, you know, just you have a more or less uniform um, you know, curve here where you might have not much light except for way over here. So again, by the same variables, if that's what we're plotting, you might just have a single little dip right there. Now, don't think of this as like, you know, this couldn't be anything like, you know, for example, if we're sampling, so I'm thinking in terms of stars, if you're, if you're looking at a star far away, if there's a little dip there, this is not a time versus intensity graph. This couldn't be caused by, for example, a transiting planet or an asteroid or something like that. Um, now, it's easy to confuse that, but this is just simply a little blotch where there's a little bit of light missing at a specific wavelength. 
And it's entirely possible there could just be a single one of these. This might, in fact, be enough to tell us how fast this galaxy is going away from us. That, that's what I have in mind here. Um, and the reason why I mention this is this typically, typically there, there's some very strong indicating lines uh, when you look at spectra. And I'll get into why this is here, um, you know, a little bit later. But if you can identify one of these gaps that usually is around, like right there. Actually, let's say one of these gaps that's usually right there. And for example, if the light from every galaxy you're seeing has a dip at exactly that wavelength. Except some of these galaxies have that same pattern that's just a lot further. They have that same dip but occurring at a much further wavelength. Sometimes the light might be so dim that you can only see a single little dip there, and so you have to focus on the most major one. And if that single dip you're seeing happens to be at a longer wavelength than what you're expecting, and there's no other way to ex explain why that line would occur there, you can reasonably assume this is what's called redshifted. And based on often a single absorption line, looking at galactic spectra, we can figure out how redshifted a galaxy is. And some of the most redshifted galaxies appear at what we call redshifts or Zs of like 10, 12, 14. Uh, I forget what the, the record holder is right now. But what that means is that their light is shifted over by a factor of 10 further than it should be. Um, and so these are incredibly distant galaxies because that means that the light has been stretched by an incredible factor, but by zoning in on those exact um, exact absorption lines, what we're doing is we're literally measuring the distance to these galaxies. And so that's why this is so important in astronomy. So the second example here is a redshifted galaxy. And by the way, by measuring this redshift, that's exactly how Hubble made his original discovery of Hubble's law, looking at further and further galaxies and seeing that they're all receding at a faster and faster rate. So what we're actually doing here is we're using Hubble's law in reverse. We're seeing how redshifted a galaxy is, and then assuming Hubble's law to be true, working backwards and figuring out how far it would have to be to be that redshifted. If you don't know what Hubble's law is, don't worry about it. Um, you should, though. It's fascinating. Okay, so um, simply speaking, again, all an, as an absorption spectra is is a continuous spectrum with a very specific set of wavelengths that we're not seeing as many as we should be. When we get into emission spectra, that's when we can give the, the reasoning for why, why we see these gaps here. Uh, I'm going to take a quick pause.